Moderator, I'm Bob Smith, the chair of the Cutting Edge of Mission Committee, which comes under the Life and Mission Agency. If you're looking for a report, it's within that of the Life and Mission Agency at uh, page 20. Uh, it's very short, no recommendations. Don't turn to it now. You want to listen to us. Um, the job of the Cutting Edge of Mission Committee each year is to find an individual or an organization which we believe to be doing cutting edge mission. That is work that is innovative and fresh, work that builds up the church and uh, proclaims the gospel message in new and compelling ways. We then inv invite that individual or representative of that organization to join us, uh, to address the assembly, to describe their work, and to receive a check in the amount of $10,000, which is awarded from the uh, Cutting Edge of Mission uh, uh, Fund, to honor their work and to assist them in advancing it. This, this is a, a great committee to be on and a, quite a wonderful task to have to be lifting up this kind of work. And this year we're pleased to present this award to Sanctuary Mental Health Ministries, whose purpose is to equip communities of faith with resources to become sanctuaries for people dealing with issues of mental health. Starting small in Vancouver, it has grown quickly and developed into a, an online presence which has a, a global scale to it. Uh, it is, I'm not going to tell you any more about it, but I will turn the, the uh, podium over to Daniel Whitehead, who I'm on my left here, who is the CEO of uh, Sanctuary Mental Health Ministries, uh, who's present with us now. And I'd also, while I'm introducing people, Right down here is Bing Ho, a member of the Sanctuary's board, who's accompanying Daniel on his trip here. So, moderator, I now present to you Daniel Whitehead of uh, Sanctuary Mental Health Ministries to, uh, to receive our award, but first of all, to address the court. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> well, it's a real honor to be with you today. Um, let me just say, if I didn't know I was at the general assembly for the Presbyterian Church in Canada, I would think I was at a NASA space launch. Um, the, the precision that you guys are doing this with is remarkable, so well done. What a team. Honorable commissioners to the 2024 General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Canada, distinguished members of the Cutting Edge of Mission Award Committee, and everyone else. My name is Daniel Whitehead, and I am the CEO of Sanctuary Mental Health Ministries, and it is an incredible honor for me to be here with you today. On behalf of our board, our staff, our supporters, and the people we serve, we are so incredibly grateful and excited for the recognition of what we've done, what we are doing, and what we will continue to do to help make the church a sanctuary for mental health here in Canada and beyond. It is a pure joy for us to accept this award, and we count it an incredible honor to join an illustrious list of people and organizations that we admire and look up to. Uh, you can imagine my excitement when I was contacted and uh, it was suggested to me we should receive this award, and I looked back at your previous recipients and saw Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I thought my, um, my late grandmother would be so proud. So, um, you know, Sanctuary is an organization that believes uh, wherever Christ is proclaimed as Lord should be the safest place for people on their mental health journeys. The church should be famous for its level of care for people in the midst of crisis. At Sanctuary, we believe that all people should feel safe in the church with their mental health and that all lived experiences of mental health challenges belong in the body of Christ. It is this belief that derives our work to create high quality educational resources and increasingly artistic creations that offer hope to people in crisis and equip the church to support mental health and well-being. Now, I have had the privilege of leading the organization for eight years, and I've seen a remarkable growth and change in that time. And I'll go off piste a moment just to mention a person in this room that I saw on the way in. And I've never had a chance to share this story in his presence. I, I often refer to it when his name comes up with other people. When I joined Sanctuary eight and a half years ago, it was a struggling small nonprofit in Vancouver with beautiful foundations. 
Essentially, um, our founding director, um, who is now a, an Anglican priest in North Vancouver, uh, Reverend Dr. Sharon Smith, her vocation is really important to Sanctuary because Sharon was an occupational therapist for 20 years. She did a double master's in theology, got ordained in the Church of England, and did a PhD on the intersection of spirituality and schizophrenia. And in the course of finishing her doctorate, her late husband Alex died by suicide. So Sanctuary has this theological, psychological, church-based, research-based focus with lived experience being absolutely central to our understanding of this subject. Now, when I joined, no one wanted to talk about mental health in the church eight and a half years ago. I remember sitting at my desk my first day. I was employed part-time. There were two, two staff. That was it. And, and not enough money to pay us. And we were sitting there trying to work out, how do we grow this thing? We would do workshops in churches of Vancouver. And I just did what I still do today. I just picked up the phone and started calling people. And no one wanted to talk to me. But one person did. And his name is Richard Topping, the president of Vancouver School of Theology. And Richard said, let's go to the pub. So, <laughs> so I remember Richard and I went to the pub. And I, I just, I'd never met him before, but I just shared, look, this is what I'm doing. I think this is a good thing. I think this could grow. I think God could be in it. And uh, Richard, right from the get-go, said, this is a good thing you're doing. And I see the need for this. And I believe in this. And I tell you, Richard, that one conversation was probably enough to keep me going in that first six months to a year. So I want to honor you and thank you for that. And uh, there's a reminder to all of us there. Sometimes people just need a friend, someone who can encourage them. So I've had the privilege of leading this ministry in Vancouver to become an, an internationally renowned organization at the forefront of educating the church to be sanctuaries for mental health. It's something that we as Canadians, I am a Canadian, this is what a Canadian sounds like. Um, I'm, I'm also not Australian, I'm English, just for the record. Um, I love Australia, but everyone thinks I'm Australian and I'm not. Uh, but it's something we can be proud of because Canada has birthed something that is helping hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And with God's help, millions more in the years ahead. But back at the start of 2020, I traveled over to the UK to do some filming. Uh, as part of my work with Sanctuary, uh, a part of what we do is we go out and film the stories of people who've lived with a mental illness or a mental health challenge and who have faithfully walked with Christ through that. And we, we capture their stories and we share that with Christians as a way to help us learn to listen to a person's story. And on that particular day, we were in the north of England and we'd gone to Durham to film with a theologian based at the University of Durham. And having filmed with him, we then moved on to a small town south of Durham and we met with a lady named Simone, who lives with a unique experience of schizophrenia. After sitting with her and listening to her story and the wisdom that came forth from her experience of life, which you can hear for yourself in the Sanctuary course, it's a resource you can download on our website for free. But I realized that I had been totally unprepared for the depths that she would take me. So much wisdom came forth from this woman as she spoke. But one of the things that majorly impacted me about Simone was the levels of stigma that she faced as a human being. In her own words, her socioeconomic background as someone who identifies as a working class person, her racial background as a black woman, her learning difficulties, and her diagnosis of schizophrenia made her a heavily stigmatized person. To put it another way, in the eyes of wider society, there was a long list of things that people saw before they saw the person the beloved daughter of God, the friend of Jesus, the member of Christ's body. You know, the subject of stigma is a very serious one. Uh, that word stigma comes from slavery, you know, chattel slavery, which was common throughout Europe and North America in the 16th and 18th centuries. And this idea that being a person uh, was, as a person, you're an object, something that, uh, something that could be purchased and owned by someone else. A slave will be purchased and then branded with a branding iron. And that mark, that wound, that scar, uh, was the chattel, which became known as the stigma. All of that person's significance and worth was reduced to that mark that they carried. Their sum total personhood was revealed in this wound. 
And this is where the word stigma comes from. It's a mark that people carry that others see instead of seeing the whole person. Now, we don't brand people with hot irons anymore, but we do brand people with labels that can be almost impossible to escape from. And the subject of mental health and mental illness is one such sticky label that we often place upon people where we see the diagnosis before we see the person, before we see the beloved child of God, the friend of Jesus, our brother and sister. If we're really honest, our Western European influence culture would say that our value is really attributed to what we can produce and how much wealth we can create and how self-sufficient we can be. But the Bible presents a very different picture of the value of a person, which is that we are not primarily made to produce, but rather we are primarily made to relate. We are not made for independence and self-sufficiency, but rather we are made for interdependence. And this leaves me wondering, what if we as a society valued the ability to love and the need to be loved more highly than our ability to be self-sufficient and materially productive? What kind of society would we have? Who would the people be that we would lift up and seek to be like if we did that? You know, one such stigmatized person, uh, there are many in the Bible, but one that I often think of is the woman with the issue of bleeding in, in Mark chapter 5. Uh, if you go back and read that at your own time, here was a woman who for 12 years had had no contact with a person, considered ceremonially unclean. She was cut off from religious and social life. For 12 years, she was untouched, unspoken to, ignored, despised, and isolated. And this rejection would have caused immense mental and emotional suffering beyond her physical ailments, as if that wasn't enough. One can only imagine the toll it took on her mental health to be so totally alone and estranged for so long. As an outcast with no money or support, she languished in poverty and was forgotten by society, every day reminded of her status as a despised outcast. When she touched Jesus, she feared his reproach. She expected him to declare her unclean, but that that doesn't happen. And Jesus asked her to speak up and identify herself. And after 12 years of strict isolation, the prospect of speaking up in public would have been terrifying, I'm sure. But Jesus insisted that she identified herself. It's as if he's saying for the first time in 12 years, you will speak, daughter, and others will listen. He gave her the space to use her voice. She was physically cured and a miracle had taken place. However, this miraculous curing brought about more than just physical restoration. By curing her biologically, Jesus removed all barriers preventing her from re-engaging with community life and the religious system. He may have cured her physically, but make no mistake, he healed her by reconnecting her relationally to God, to others, and herself. When we are open and accepted and loved in community, it becomes a lot easier to love God and ourselves. When we are stigmatized and rejected by society, it becomes a lot harder to receive God's love and to love ourselves as our neighbors. Now, while the biological cure was immediate, the deeper healing was a process that was just beginning. Jesus began her recovery by eliminating all the factors that excluded her from love. I would suggest that the deeper healing that Jesus offered people was not primarily about biomedical curing, but rather it was relational. Jesus restored people to community by removing the stigmatizing barriers and providing a space, which we now call the church, for people to heal and be seen and loved in community. And this destigmatizing story leaves, leaves us with that, that question. Leaves us with a question that says, what if spiritual friendship is one of the primary means through which God is making all things new? In John 15, 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, now I call you friends. This is a phenomenal passage. It changes everything. God calling a broken humanity his friends is life-changing. And to call someone a friend in the midst of crisis can be life-changing for them too. And of course, we must remember that historically, the church has always met practical needs at the center of society. Uh, there's a reason there's a church at the center of every town, city, and village. There's certainly a Presbyterian church at the center of them. 
And that's because it was always the heartbeat of community. It was the place where healthcare, welfare, justice, education, practical needs were being met. And uh, we were at Knox Church yesterday and it was just a hive of activity. And I said, it's so wonderful to see a building that's celebrating the arts, music in the afternoon, workshops, people in and out. It's a beautiful picture of what the body of Christ is meant to be, a lighthouse in society. And of course, this story in Mark 5 would do well to remind us is that every story has a context and a trajectory. Life is filled with moments and seasons, seasons of languishing and seasons of flourishing. And we as God's people are part of a story which makes this theme central. And of course, Jesus, God incarnate, had mental health. We see in scripture times when he languished. Think of the Garden of Gethsemane. Or think of him hanging on a cross, crying out to his father. The Bible makes space for every human experience with inclusive compassion, including the most difficult experiences we face. And so we too must convey this sense of inclusive compassion to all people at all stages of their lived experience, and especially to those that are crying out and not getting a response, just like Jesus. Now, let me just conclude this with one more story. Now, on that trip uh, to Durham those few years back, after we'd filmed with Simone, we drove up to Sunderland because we had made contact with a man through a very tenuous link. This person had been really hard to pin down, but we had one email uh, from him with an address and a date and a time, and that was it. So we drove up from Durham, me and a cameraman, and uh, we drove to Sunderland, right in the northeast of England. We parked on this little street lined with row houses. We found the number and we rang the bell. And then we waited. We saw lights on inside. And so we waited and waited what felt like a long time. And just as we were about to say, well, you know, this isn't happening. Clearly he's not in. The door opened. And here was this man who was pretty unsteady on his feet. His name was Mick. And we soon realized why it took Mick so long to answer the door. It was because Mick lived in a converted uh, garage at the end of the garden. Uh, we had to walk through the corridor of the row house, down this long, uh, little, narrow English garden, right to the end to a garage big enough to house a car, a small English car at that. And uh, that's where Mick lived on his own. The home was in some disarray, but we settled in, we set up the camera, and we began chatting with Mick. It became very evident very quickly that all of the footage we were filming would not be usable. Not only did Mick have a very strong northern accent, which was hard enough for me to understand as an Englishman, but his speech was slurred due to the medication he was on, and it was hard for him to string together more than four or five words in a row. And yet when I think about the work that I've given my life to doing at Sanctuary, I think of Mick. Because in Mick, I was confronted with a man who through all intents and purposes was completely forgotten by society. He lived alone, he was unable to communicate effectively. He said he would turn up very late to the Catholic Church and leave early because he didn't have great experiences of speaking with people. And the medication he was on to help with his experiences of psychosis left him with a number of very difficult side effects and tics, which he carried in his body. And yet as I spoke to Mick, I found out he was a former teacher and a passionate musician, evidenced by the few guitars lying around his home. And when I gave up the idea of trying to capture his story, I said, Mick, will you play us a song? And so he picked up his guitar and uh, he proverbially took us to church. He sang and played for 10 or 15 minutes, just strumming melodious uh, folk songs, singing as if he was a man reborn. It was quite a, a remarkable thing to witness. And in that space, my awareness of God's presence heightened, and I knew it was as if I was in the presence of Christ himself. It was in listening to this man play music, seeing the hidden life, that was within him, hidden by his scarred and stigmatized body, confronted with so many unanswered questions that I saw through the stigmatized facade and I saw God's image. And as I thought of Mick's unanswered questions, I was confronted with the unanswered question that Christ screams out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a question that just hangs there. 
a question that does not get answered. As I left Sunderland, I left wondering what I would do with Mick's story. Well, three months passed by and I got an email from someone and it said this. Hello, you don't know me. My father was a man named Mick. And he passed away a month ago. I found a single email written to you to arrange some filming. And I would love to know if you still have that footage. I didn't see my father much before he died. And he didn't have any friends. And it seems like this footage might be quite important for me and my sister. Meeting Mick was not about the film or fulfilling some organizational agenda that I had. It was about seeing Mick, hearing his story, and encountering Christ in the midst of his story, and sitting with him in the unanswered questions. I think if we, the church, can learn to do this for each other, then we may just begin to create a church that makes a little more space for people in the midst of their mental health languishing to find their place in the body of Christ. We live in a world that so desperately needs a place. Everyone is looking for a home. You know, and if renewal or revival is to come to the church, as I hear people talk about, I think it will come about through a church that stops and sits and listens to those that are suffering. I think if we can learn to do that, then we will experience and hear the voice of Christ afresh in the voices of those like Mick, who are desperately seeking shalom in the midst of the storms of life. In preparing for this talk, I found the last email that Mick sent to me, uh, sent just after he'd filmed with him shortly before he died. He concluded his letter by saying this, please pray that I can have the grace to do what I can for folk like me. There's a battle ahead. It's gonna be won, but it's up to us to keep the faith. Mick was fighting his own battle. Some of you may be fighting a battle today. He fought his battle hidden away out of sight from others. And of course, what he needed were others to fight with him and for him. You may not see the battle that someone is going through, but that doesn't mean it's not real. And one thing we all need along the way are friends to support us. Thank you so much for this award. We are deeply moved and profoundly honored to receive it. And this award will motivate us to continue to fight for others like Mick. God bless you. behalf of the church here it is this is the award thank you so much and thank you for these words they make your ministry real to some folks i'm from vancouver so i've known sanctuary for a while used your website but your words make your ministry real to people who now care with you about your ministry thank you. so thank you so much thank you bless thank you, you. Thank, thank you thank you and then there's also a gift from oh. the church as well oh, thank, thank you so you very much, much. Thank, thank you thank you everyone thank you, thank you.